Good afternoon. Welcome to today's colloquium. Our speaker today, Greg Gabor, is an American author and physicist who specializes in the study of classical coherence theory in optical physics. He's a full professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in the Department of Physics and Optical Science. Greg received his BA in physics from the University of Chicago, his MA in physics, whoops, a little bit of feedback, uh, from the University of Rochester, and his PhD from the University of Rochester. He was selected as a fellow of the Optical Society in 2020. Greg does research on the merging of singular optics with optical coherence theory aimed at improving free space optical communications. He's also been very active in the study of optical invisibility and invisibility cloaks, a topic of one of his books. And his recent work applies to the techniques use, sorry, uh, his recent work applies the techniques of singular optics for high resolution imaging. Greg maintains an active interest in the history of science. He founded and co-moderated a history of science blog carnival, The Giant's Shoulders, uh, from 2008 to 2014. He maintains a popular science and science history weblog, Skulls in the Stars. He's also written popular articles for several magazines, including La Recherche, American Scientist, and Optics and Photonics News. And with that, let's welcome Greg to the lab. Okay, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Let me just do a quick pointer test, all right. Yeah, and today I'm going to talk about falling felines and fundamental physics. And this is really about history and physics together. It's a surprisingly long history of scientists studying how cats always land on their feet. And everybody knows the talent in question we're talking about. It goes by many names over the years. Cat writing reflex, cat flipping, cat turning, the cat twist, or just saying cats always land on their feet. And the, the animation that I show there is just one of many examples you can find on the internet without any context. And what we'd like to do today is talk a bit about how a, what a cat is actually doing in that video and how we learned about it and what people will have been doing with that knowledge since then. Let me go back first to talk about the fact that this is an idea and an observation that has a long history. This, um, these images here from a book of kind of coats of arms from 1572, and it specifically calls out the fact that the cat is a cruel beast when he is wild and falleth on his own feet from most high places. These, these coat of arms were basically used to characterize you know, the properties of the family or the nobility that it represented. But it goes back a long time that people realized that cats could do something very strange. In fact, after I published my book, one of my former students, uh, Morteza Karami, um, who's Muslim, did me a favor because I had long heard a story that that there was an explanation dating back to the time of Muhammad, uh, the prophet, that the prophet Muhammad had actually blessed cats with the ability to land on their feet. And Morteza very graciously tracked that down for me because I could never find the original explanation. And in fact, it goes back to a Persian poet named Rumi in the year 1318. And the story, I put the whole story there in case you want to read it, but to summarize it, the story as it goes is that the prophet was sitting around one day and a snake showed up and um, asked for protection from another animal, a hedgehog that wanted to eat the snake, and the prophet protected the snake. The hedgehog went off, and then the snake said, well, I'm going to bite you anyway. And so the prophet was in trouble, but then a cat happened to wander by. And the cat saw what was going on, and the cat massacred the snake. And so the prophet, in thanks, basically stroked the cat's back. And from then on, the cat could always land on its feet when falling from any height. Obviously not a scientific explanation, but the earliest known explanation of how a cat lands on its feet. In science, it goes back surprisingly far, too. And 
I won't even mention the earliest example, which goes back to the year 1700, and I'll jump ahead to the mid-1800s, where some surprisingly famous scientists were intrigued by the problem of falling cats. The most famous of these is James Clerk Maxwell, and I love this quote that he wrote to his wife when he later visited Trinity College as a prestigious scientist. He said that there was a tradition in Trinity that when I was here, I discovered a method of throwing a cat so as not to light on its feet, and that I used to throw cats out of windows. And he basically has to explain, no, I was not throwing cats out of windows. I was just seeing how they landed on their feet, and they always did it. And it's striking that um, Maxwell, who was obviously very smart, saw that there was something very interesting going on in what the cat was doing, and he couldn't quite explain it. And he was not the only one. George Gabriel Stokes, his Irish colleague, around the same era, was also very interested in how cats landed on their feet. And this reminisced by his daughter talks about how he was interested in how cats could fall and also liked to examine the cat's eyes and the dog's eyes um, just to do ophthalmology on the animals. But Clerk Maxwell's dog was the only one that really seemed to enjoy the ophthalmology investigations. But these two examples show you that really smart scientists, really groundbreaking scientists, saw something interesting and special going on there. But they couldn't figure out what was going on properly, and there was a very good reason for that. And the reason is that a cat flips over way too fast for the human eye to really see what's going on in, uh, at normal speeds. So, Really, this, solving the cat problem would require the development of high-speed photography. And in the era of Maxwell and Stokes, photography was very slow. It was invented in 1820 by the Nietzsche brothers. And if you look back at the Nietzsche brothers' original photographs, which they're reproductions of, they would literally have to point their camera out the window and take an exposure for days of like the house next door in order to get an image. And the speed increased rapidly, but was still quite slow through the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s. I like to show this image. This is one of the candidates for the oldest cat photos in existence. That's from the Houghton Library. And the reason I like this one is it shows you part of the problem, is that you know, the cat's mostly drinking from a saucer, a saucer, but you know, most of the cat's in focus except for the head that's actually moving. Anything moving could not be captured by photographs. But things were inevitably going to change. Edward uh, Moybridge, who was originally Edward Muggeridge, if I remember, he, re he changed his name several times during his life. He became obsessed with taking high-speed photographs. And in particular, in 1878, um, he, he got as a patron Leland Stanford, the Stanford who founded Stanford University. Stanford had this ongoing bet with a bunch of his rich friends about whether a horse, when it's at a trot or a gallop, has all of its legs off the ground or not. And so Stanford basically commissioned Moybridge to take a series of high-speed photographs of the horse in motion. Obviously, there were still photographs at the time. They've been since compiled into a nice animation to show us what's going on, but to demonstrate that, yes, a um, horse does have all of its legs off the ground at a gallop. And this was a huge game changer, not just for Leland Stanford, who presumably won a bet, but for science. But before I mention the science, I should also mention that artists were a bit traumatized by this. There were artists such as Theodore Garicald and Ernest Massonnier. Um, of course, the artists, when horses are galloping, like the falling cat, they gallop too fast to really see what's going on. So artists came up with these stylized impressions of what a horse should look like when it's at a gallop. And the 1820 Derby of Epsom is a famous painting by Garicault. And you can see the sort of flying gallop, where all the legs are fully extended and the horse in midair. And I, managed to track down this study of a horse by Massonnier that shows the same thing. But uh, Moybridge's photos showed none of that. So the art world was kind of thrown into a minor turmoil to try and adjust and started a big debate that kind of carries on to this day. Do we, do we paint things 
how we would realistically see them or do we paint them how we think we should see them? And I love this little tidbit. Masonier apparently took the news particularly hard. There was a newspaper article um, about uh, Stanford visiting Masonier in 1879. Stanford was trying to get Masonier to paint his portrait. And Stanford brought along photographs of the galloping horse. And according to the report, Masonier's eyes were filled with wonder and astonishment. How, all these years, my eyes have deceived me. The machine cannot lie. And you know, it was almost pitiful to see the old man sorrowly relinquish his convictions of so many years, and tears filled his eyes as he examined that he was too old to unlearn and begin anew. Now, one thing I thought about when I read this quote, though, is who actually wrote this article? This was probably a meeting between Masonier and Stanford himself. So I have kind of strong suspicions that Stanford, at the very least, directed the writing of this article to make himself look much better. And it is worth noting that Masonier, even if he did take the news very hard at first, he eventually became the biggest champion of some of these high-speed photography experiments that were done. But the biggest person, and the one that really brings us to the relevant topic of falling cats, is Etienne Jules Marais. Um, Muybridge's photographs of a galloping horse drew, the, drew worldwide attention and drew the attention of the French physiologist Marais. And Marais was very interested in how animals move. And he was also interested in the galloping horse problem. And I love this intermediate image because before photography, Muybridge, uh, Marais was creating mechanical means of testing when a horse's feet were on the ground. So we had these sort of you know, these little balloons attached to the hooves of the horse that went to a little pressure reader that then would give you a readout of when each foot was hitting the ground. But Marais knew that this was a problem. Mary was one of the kind of early people who realized that the more you mess with the actual motion of the animal, the more you're probably not recording the actual motion of the animal in nature. And so he was really excited to take up photography where he could take pictures of an animal in motion without influencing the animal in any way. Little side note, one of Mary's first um, devices was this sphygmograph, which measured the heart rate or the pulse of a person. And the story about that is that that gave Mary an early career boost because he was demonstrating it to the emperor Napoleon III and he was taking a pulse measurements of a bunch of people in front of, the, um, in front of the emperor, and one person had an irregular pulse, and that person died three days later. And so suddenly everybody was like, okay, Mary apparently has made a device that really works well and actually tells you something. But that brings us to the cat. And what happened is, is that once Mary started doing photography, and there was a really long trial and error of him developing his own photographic techniques, he started filming the motions of every animal imaginable. And the interesting thing is, the cat was almost an afterthought. A colleague of his said, as long as you're filming animals, you might as well drop a cat and see what happens. <laughs> and in fact, he. Um, the gardener of the Mary Institute, he had an institute where he did all his work, the gardener had a cat, so he borrowed the gardener's cat and dropped it and filmed, took this now famous series of photographs. Well, the interesting thing is, is that Mary probably didn't think this would be that big of a deal. He thought it would be a good demonstration of his techniques, and he presented his work at the French Academy of Sciences on October 22nd. And the words here, this is one of my favorite quotes in all of the history of science, especially the kicker, because Mary presented his results before the Academy of Sciences, and a lively discussion ensued. The difficulty was to explain how the cat could turn itself around without a fulcrum to assist in the operation. My favorite sentence of all time in history, one member declared that Monsieur Mary had presented them with a scientific paradox in direct contradiction with the most elementary mechanical principles. Remember, we're talking about a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Newspapers of the day had a field day with this, by the way. They were absolutely delighted to see the French Academy so perplexed. 
But why was this so perplexing? This wouldn't seem like it would be such a shocking, these photographs, why did these photographs cause trouble? Well, this brings us to conservation laws, and probably most of the audience is familiar with conservation laws. So, but just a little reminder, we now know that there are these fundamental quantities in nature that are conserved, like energy, and that energy is not created or destroyed, but converted from one form to another. If you have a car on a hill, you step on the gas, you convert chemical energy into kinetic energy. It goes downhill, gravitational potential energy turns into kinetic energy. You step on the brakes, that kinetic energy turns into heat and sound. And so things are conserved, and that became a guiding principle of physics. And one of those guiding, those additional conservation laws is, of course, conservation of angular momentum. The idea that there's a conserved momentum of rotation. And I like to use this sort of extreme example that conservation of angular momentum implies if one thing rotates in one direction, something else has to rotate in the other direction. So if you're riding your bike on the Earth and you're circling around the Earth, in principle, the Earth is slightly circling the other way. Very slight because of the mass difference, of course. Now, angular momentum is defined, and this will be important for our discussion, defined as the angular speed, how fast something is rotating, times the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia of an object depends on how far away the mass is from the center of rotation. So if you have a big wheel with a lot of mass really far away from the center, it has a high moment of inertia. If you have a smaller wheel, it's gonna have a smaller moment of inertia. But, and if you distribute the mass instead of all the way at the boundary, but throughout the center of the disk, you're gonna have an even smaller moment of inertia. And of course, figure skaters take advantage of this when they do spins. Actually, I'm a figure skater, so I've done this experiment myself. Um, that what you do if you want to speed up, you have, a cons you have a constant angular momentum when you go into your spin, and if you want to speed up, you bring your arms and legs in, which is reducing your moment of inertia, which means that your angular speed has to go up. Now, why, what does this have to do with the, the cat problem? Well, because conserv of conservation of angular momentum, people thought that the only way something could start rotating or something, the only way that something could change direction in midair is if it were already rotating when it left its perch. So the way of thinking of a cat, and this is a quote, Peter Guthrie Tate, year after Maxwell died, later described Maxwell's thinking of it. And just to paraphrase again, um, Maxwell imagined that when a cat starts to fall, it kind of pushes off of something to start itself rotating. And then if it needs to rotate faster, it pulls its paws in. If it wants to rotate slower, it sticks them out, and therefore it can land on its feet by just adjusting. But the important thing is, is they thought you have to have some initial rotation in order to change direction. And this was really formalized by a French physicist and astronomer, Charles Eugène Dallonnet, who, who really said, yeah, there, the, if you have an animated being isolated in space, um, it will not be able to move its center of gravity, and it will not be possible to move around this point. You can only develop inner forces. So Dallonnet said, yeah, if you, if you start falling with no rotation, there's no way you can change your direction no matter how you flail around. And this is an, a great illustrative example of how a little knowledge is a dangerous thing because people had just figured out what angular momentum was and that it was conserved, and they immediately kind of tried to apply it to everything. And sure, if you're talking about a rigid rotating body like a bicycle wheel, um, the, angular, the speed of rotation is proportional to the angular momentum. So the only way a wheel can, has angular momentum is if it's spinning. So if you're talking about rigid bodies, that argument of Dallonet works perfectly well. However, cats are not rigid bodies. <laughs> this is my cat, Cookie. That's her as a kitten and as an adult, and she's had the same twisted, um, spine-defying pose her entire life. And that's the catch, that we, when, we're when we start talking about objects that have all sorts of internal degrees of freedom, you can do things that wouldn't necessarily seem possible at a glance. 
And a lot of people jumped into trying to, once people started to figure out that this was the issue, that, well, cats are not, are, can move parts of their body, everybody started jumping in on the action and trying to explain how a cat does what it does. Um, uh, including a famed Italian mathematician, Giuseppe Piano. And he's, his suggestion is what I like to call propeller tail, <laughs> that a cat spins its tail like a propeller, and because its tail starts going one way, the body has to rotate the other way. Um, this may be, this is probably part of the solution that cats use, but it can't be the only solution because somewhere around the 1980s, I believe, somebody dropped tailless cats and found that they could flip over just fine. So no matter, no matter how much we like propeller tail, um, it's not the only thing that cats can do. And all of these drawings were done by my roommate, uh, Sarah, who's an artist, because I have no artistic skill whatsoever. Um, now, Mary himself, the guy who did the original photographs, his explanation was based on the angle, about changing the moment of inertia. And from Mary's point of view, so imagine you have a cat that's completely upside down. Well, what it could do is it can do kind of one part of its body than the other. So first it sticks out its rear legs, and now when it turns the front part of its, the front part of its body has a smaller moment of inertia than the rear. So it rotates the front of its body. The rear doesn't counter-rotate very much. And then it switches. It sticks its front legs out and kind of straightens its rear legs. So now the back has a smaller moment of inertia, and it can rotate that without the front changing. And then the cat is right side up. And this was widely accepted to be the solution in Mary's time, but that's not really the primary way that a cat turns over either. And the way that really works the best first was discovered by Rademacher and Terbrock, some uh, Dutch physiologists in 1933. And Rademacher and Terbrock said, okay, imagine, you, imagine your cat is just two cylinders, you know, kind of, you know, this is, this is a you know, quintessential physics demonstration. Let's imagine our cat is cylinders. <laughs> and, well, suppose that the cat completely bends at the waist so that those two cylinders are right next to each other. Now those cylinders can rotate in opposite directions, 180 degrees. And when they do that, now when the cat unfolds its body, it's going to be 180 degrees turned. It goes from being upside down, it bends and it twists, and then it opens up its body again and it's right side up. And this is how Rademacher and Terbrock drew it. I kind of describe this as a hot dog with a demon face. Um, <laughs> I'm not the only one that cannot do art and science, it seems. <laughs> but now we can go back with that Rademacher and Terbrock explanation. We can go back and look at Mary's images. And we can actually spot that, yeah, bend and twist is really a big thing. Here's the cat. It's bent and it's tilted sideways, sort of the, the rear half and the front half of the cat are at an angle and rotated sideways. And so this, for me, kind of really, you can go back and look at those pictures, you can kind of watch this video carefully, and you can see that bend and twist motion in action. Now, I should note that the French Academy was a laughing stock for a little while, but they rallied quickly. Everybody went home, and by the very next meeting of the French Academy, they had, they'd figured out the problem. Um, and this is, again, a news quote that at the next meeting, Monsieur Maurice Levy rose and kind of went to the blackboard and did some calculations and said, OK, no, we, we've misunderstood this angular momentum thing. It's all fine. And I love the uh, peace settled down in the academy. The case is settled. And then it started people on thinking of all the different ways that animals could flip over. And another scientist in that era said, hey, a snake, if it falls, could actually turn its body into like an Ouroboros, where it's almost eating its tail, and then just rotate the inside out, outside in, and flip itself over, which I just thought was a delightful image, which I also had to get an illustration of. So what's interesting is that kind of solved the physics problem of cats falling and landing on their feet, though I'll say a bit more about it as we go. But to some extent, the physics part was sort of solved. But that wasn't the end of the falling cat problem, because physiologists got involved. And I mentioned Rademacher and Terbrock's work. 
and how they came up with bend and twist. And that was because in the 1920s and 30s, physiologists started being very interested in how animal reflexes work. How does an animal know, how does an animal's reflexes trigger under different circumstances? And the cat was a really ideal, the cat writing reflex was an ideal case and also a very intriguing one. And the reason it was intriguing is in part due to Einstein's relativity. So people had done experiments and they'd blindfolded cats and they dropped the cat. And the cat still lands on its feet. But Einstein's theory of general relativity really tells us that when you're in true free fall, when you're falling with, with the force of gravity freely acting upon you, you feel weightless. You can't tell what direction is up or down. Um, and I've, I also have skydived. If you ever jump out of a hot air balloon, you experience that. It's a very weird feeling to be truly weightless. Um, and this was a drawing my roommate made of just illustrating Einstein's principle of saying that an acceleration upward is kind of equivalent to gravity pulling you downward. And Rademacher and Terbrock, they did a lot of experiments to try and figure out how a blindfolded cat knows which way is up even when it's falling. And so this image incidentally shows them dropping cats from a variety of different positions. They wanted to drop the cats with its head facing upward, but its body twisted in every other conceivable way to see what the cat would do. And physiology led right into the 1950s and the space race. And yeah, these videos are great. These are probably from the, the videos on the right are from the 1950s after the so-called vomit comet became a thing. Um, you might ask why we care about how cats land. Well, the interesting thing is when we first started thinking of ast sending astronauts up into space, we had no idea what would happen to their bodies. And there was a very real concern that our brains might not even be able to handle an extended period of weightlessness. So there was the thinking that our brains, are, our reflexes are so conditioned to experience gravity that if we go up and um, into weightless environment, we just may go nuts. So they wanted to do a lot of tests by putting animals and people in weightless environments as long as they could to see what happens. And while they were at it, they started saying, well, we know cats have this interesting gravity-related writing reflex. Let's see what happens if we take cats up into airplanes into these weightless maneuvers. And these photos are some of my favorite because before we had the big like C-130s that could do these parabolic trajectories for weightlessness, they just took a cat up in a fighter jet. <laughs> And you have to imagine, you know, those pilots are already daring, but, you know, taking a cat into this confined space <laughs> and making it really mad was probably even more brave. <laughs> but a lot of these exper experiments and also just the work of finally getting people into extended periods of weightlessness made us convinced, okay, people are not going to freak out if we send them into space. But there was another interesting problem, and that was, we thought, well, if we do send people into space and they're floating weightless, how do they change directions? And here again is where the cat comes into play because, and I love the fact that there was an entire research project based on how do we let people rotate in a weightless environment? Weightless man self-rotation techniques. And it's in this that, again, the researchers said, well, we know how cats supposedly do it, so we'll convert that into something people can do, and we'll use that as part of our training manual. Now here, I've got a video, if it plays, of my friend Amy Shira Title, who happened to um, demonstrate these weightless techniques. And hopefully, if the video starts, so they can start it in the back, we can see a little bit of this. Amy's written some excellent books on the history of the space, and I thank her for showing me, um, doing this demonstration, allowing me to use it. So, rotate around the z-axis, the cat reflex. This is basically Mary's original tuck and turn method. Bend and twist is what I said is the main cat rotation technique. There you go. 
If you also want to rotate around your z-axis, you can just swing your arms around. That's propeller tail. Or you can do a single arm propeller tail. And you can see your cat is completely unimpressed in there. And, but you can also rotate around other axes. You can do rotate around the x-axis, and then you have the signal flag capable approach, reach and turn. But again, a lot of these were inspired by cat motions. It was the fact that we know that cats can turn over when they're basically in free fall that inspired people to look at the ways that we can turn, turn around, humans can turn in a weightless environment. And there's the y-axis stuff. And one more, I think this is the last one. And I'll save us from going the outtakes. All right, stop, stop. All right, how do I move on? Ah, there we go. Uh, oh, I start, okay, there we go. So this actually was a really serious question. Um, how do, how do we turn in space? Um, and the most famous study of this was done by engineers Kane and Scher. They were funded by NASA to study the falling cap problem. And they did computer simulations first to look for optimal solutions. And the image on the left shows one of their computer simulations superimposed over a cat. And then they took acrobats put them in spacesuits and put them on trampolines and said, we need you to reproduce these motions. So you can picture they watch a cat fall, they go to the computer, they churn out a sheet of paper with maneuvers and they hand it to this guy in a spacesuit and say, keep bouncing until you get a series of photos. And this appeared in fact in Life Magazine and I think around in the 1960s, which is really striking that you can see that, yeah, the human can do more or less the same writing technique as a cat. It's sort of curious though that that whole, not ma, that, that whole book about how an astronaut can turn over, I've never heard of any astronaut actually using that. And my guess is that, you, my guess is that they underestimated the human ability to figure things out for ourselves. And that they probably, they put together this whole book and said, here's a bunch of techniques you can train to do. And then people went up into a weightless environment and they said, it's really just easy to figure this out myself. And so people just dropped it and let them figure it out. <laughs> now, the next area that we end up seeing cats um, and falling cats is feline high-rise syndrome. And this appeared in probably about the 1980s. And what happened is, um, and this is veterinary research, uh, people started living in taller and taller buildings, and cats, of course, started falling out of those buildings. If you've ever had a cat, you know that they have no you know, sense of safety, so walking on a 22-story balcony is not an issue. That is not a real cat, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, CGI. But, um, veterinarians started noticing that cats were coming into their clinics with injuries from falling from heights, but they noticed something really strange. They first documented the injuries the cats were experiencing, but then they started correlating the injuries with the height that the cat fell from. And they found that the number of injuries seems to go down after the cat is falling from a height of about eight stories. That if they fall from one floor to eight floors, the injury, average injuries increase. After eight floors, it drops dramatically. And people still don't really understand why that's the case, because thankfully nobody's doing controlled experiments of tossing their cats out of you know, buildings. So all we have to rely on is you know, people bringing their pets in, and there could be some sort of survivor bias that we're unaware of. Now, thinking of skydiving cats, there's at least one cat that earned a, par a, Canadian, a Toronto parachuting award for falling from, I believe, 13 stories. This appeared in a newspaper showing the cat being presented with its free fall award. And that brings us to sort of the, the final, the most modern era of why do we care about falling cats, and that is why, can we make a cat, a robot cat that can do the same thing a real cat can do? And so robotics researchers have turned to the problem to try and design a robot 
that can land on its feet when it falls from any position. And I really love this animation that these folks did in 1998 because it is very 1998 animation. Um, and reminds me of certain music videos of the era. And so I just love that picture. But it's, a real in it's an interesting problem. And part of the reason you might be interested in this is if you're designing robots to go into dangerous areas, you're gonna design a robot to go look for survivors in a collapsed building or something, that robot's gonna be on bad terrain and it might even fall from a height and you wanna minimize damage. So being able to program your robot to land on its feet becomes a very important thing. And people have gone through and tried out all the models and prototypes of, of, of fall, uh, all the types of falling that cats can do. So some people do base their robots on tuck and turn, Mary's approach. Often people use bend and twist, which is the modern Rademacher and Terbrock approach. And the most recent example I found before my book came out was done by a group of researchers and they programmed a robot to produce pretty much a bend and twist maneuver. They drop it upside down and it's programmed to land on its feet, almost exactly the same way that Mary recorded cats landing on their feet a century earlier. But I mentioned that this is a programmed bend and twist. Basically, the robot is programmed to rotate 180 degrees by the time it lands. So if you drop it upside down, it lands right side up. If you drop it on its left side, it's going to land on its right side. And this ends up being a real problem because you really want a robot that can, that can right itself from any position like a cat that can you know, fall in any particular way in any configuration. But the problem, as I understand it, is there are, in essence, too many possible solutions. A cat has many degrees of freedom, again, very non-rigid body. So if you start trying to program a robot to do a cat-like maneuver, it may get stuck trying to find a unique solution. And I like to analogize this to the classic problem of burdens, ass, or donkey, which is a philosophical problem that's usually used to discuss free will. The thought experiment is you have this donkey sitting between two equal piles of hay to eat, but the piles are both exactly the same distance away, so the donkey can go to eat. The, both piles have basically the same benefit. So the donkey ends up not being able to figure out what to do, and it ends up just sitting there and going hungry. And that's really the same sort of problem that people seem to have in making robots that can self-write from any configuration. Is you've got to be able to come up with some sort of criteria to cross one of those solutions off the list. But we don't necessarily need to have robots for falling. Another thing that people have been doing is saying, well, we can also make robots that actually look like cats that are built in with artificial intelligence that can serve as useful companions to the elderly for people who aren't able to take care of a pet themselves but want some sort of companionship. And it can also basically keep track of important events on their calendars. So there's more than one way to make a robotic cat. It doesn't just have to be a falling cat. Well, that's a lot of information. So one question you might ask is, well, how do cats really turn over? And it's interesting that people still argue about this to this day. And my understanding of why people still argue about it to this day is that there isn't really just one method that cats use. We've mentioned three different methods that cats can use to turn over. Bend and twist, tuck and turn, and propeller tail. And bend and twist is probably the most important and most efficient motion. But if you look at those photos of Mary and others, you can see that cats are sticking their limbs out in weird directions all the time. So they're probably doing some tuck and turn work as well. And they're, if they do have a tail, you'll often see that tail flailing rapidly. So the way I summarize this is physicists are often, it's often built into us as physicists to look for the simplest solution to a problem. You know, we have a physical phenomenon, we don't understand it, we look for some sort of simple explanation. But nature doesn't care about simplicity, it cares about efficiency. So if there are three different maneuvers that are completely independent that'll help a cat turn over, it'll use all three at once. And this ends up turning um, 
cat, uh, people studying falling cats, it ends up becoming almost a Rorschach test for people, that they watch the video and they can see that motion in it they want to see. I actually once wrote a little short paper for a journal, kind of a, an educational paper to sort of talk about the bend and twist maneuver. And it ended up getting rejected. And part of the rejection was the um, reviewer saying, well, I watched some YouTube videos, and I don't, that doesn't look like what's happening to me. <laughs> I'm still kind of bitter about that, actually. <laughs> um, let me talk about briefly about one other profound connection that cats have to physics, and that's what's called geometric phases. Cat turning is actually a beautiful example of a general phenomenon in physics, typically referred to as a geometric phase. And a geometric phase is when you take a system through a closed circuit of states and bring it back to its original, but somehow the system is not back to its original state anyway. And an early example of this, it was unrecognized as a geometric phase at the time, is Foucault's pendulum. Great way to demonstrate the rotation of the Earth. You let a pendulum swing. If it swings long enough, you'll see the pendulum change direction. And I don't know if this picture is accurate, but I find it very funny to imagine people sitting in an auditorium watching a pendulum swing for you know hours. But you can ask. Um, if you look at Foucault's pendulum, the amount, of rotation, the, the amount of orientation change you see depends on where you are on the globe. If you're on the equator, the pendulum doesn't change direction at all. If you're at the pole, the pendulum will rotate 360 degrees in the course of a day. If you're somewhere around Paris, you'll see a 270 degree rotation. So a full day goes by, the Earth has done one full rotation, but the pendulum has not. And one way you can understand that is if you move along a la so if you move along um, a straight line on a sphere, that's a great circle. The equator is a great circle. So if you move along the equator, you're following a straight line. If you follow a latitude line, that's not a great circle. In order to stay on that latitude line, you've got to actually turn a little bit yourself to stay on that line. So the amount of turning that you have to do in order to keep yourself on your latitude line, implicitly because the Earth is really doing the moving, gives you that extra un unexpected phase. <clears throat> now, geometric phase really made a splash in 1984. Professor Michael Berry noticed that this could happen in quantum systems, that if you take a certain quantum system and you take it through a closed path in parameter space and bring it back to its original state, it may have an extra phase built into it. And once Barry recognized that geometric phase, people started recognizing it everywhere. And people recognized that in the 1950s, the Indian researcher Pancharatnam noticed that if you do the same thing to the polarization of light, you get something similar happening. That suppose you, st and it's tricky because if you think about the phase of a wave of light, there's what you'd call the dynamic phase. The wave is always wiggling in time. So when we talk about the geometric phase, we're talking about a change that happens that isn't connected to that overall time wiggle. And it can be pretty hard to isolate. But if you want to understand how it happens, there's a really nice demonstration. Imagine this is your left-hand circular state of polarization, and let's ignore that dynamic phase, that oscillation in time. Imagine we're at this point on the circle. Now we just ask, what happens if we change our state of polarization? If I introduce a polarizer that makes it vertically polarized, it takes that circle, squashes it to ellipse, to linear polarization. Now I use a rotator polarization element, and it's going to rotate that linear polarization and that dot along with it. And now we use a quarter wave plate to reinflate that oscillating linear polarization to circular polarization again. And now we're back to left hand circular polarization, but there's a pi over 2 phase difference from where we started. All we've done is manipulated the geometric shape of that ellipse and we've ended up changing its orientation. And all of this can be done 
It can be described very elegantly on what's called the Poincaré sphere. You can describe every state of polarization on a sphere. And the, the top of the sphere is left-hand circular, bottom is right-hand circular. Linear polarization is on the equator. And if you calculate the area that your closed path of polarization takes, the phase change, the geometric phase, is equal to half the solid angle of that path. So it becomes a really great, simple way to calculate what the geometric phase is by geometry. Um, it seemed at first that that would be kind of a curiosity, but nowadays people actually use this Pontiaratnam phase to manipulate the, light fa the phase of a light wave. You can stick a bunch of little birefringent crystals that manipulate the state of polarization. You put them in different orientations in the cross section of a light wave, and you can get different sort of optical effects out, focusing, making optical vortices, doing all sorts of strange stuff. So it's gone from being sort of an obscure mathematical curiosity to a very practical effect. Incidentally, you can, make a ge you can make a cat sphere, too. We can talk about the geometric phase of a cat. We can describe the bend angle of the cat and the twist angle of the cat, and we can map that to the sphere. And we can also predict how much the cat will overall rotate based on the area covered by our closed path on the sphere. In fact, this helped me understand something curious about Rademacher and Tabrak's bend and twist interpretation. Remember I said, bend and twist, you imagine the cat bends pretty hard. It twists in that orientation, then it unbends. But cats can't really back bend that extreme. There's a no bend zone. So picture this as the top of the cat sphere I introduced. Um, and that made me realize that, no, what, what you're going to see is the cat's going to optimize and, and try and maximize the amount of area it can cover on the sphere within that allowable bend region. And if you look at Kane and Scher's paper where they did all these computer simulations, that's kind of what they found, that the cat has a more complicated bend maneuver because it's taking advantage of the ways it can bend. OK, I've got a few minutes left, and now I get to go to the fun stuff, tons of cat videos and other animals. <clears throat> and this part of the fun of writing my book on falling felines is that now I see the cat twist everywhere. And every time I see a cat video of a cat doing something strange, I like have to write a blog post about it because I'm like, that's something new. I haven't seen that. This was a viral video a couple of years ago. Watch this cat. It goes from facing the camera within a kind of a, a second to facing away from the camera. Apparently, the car behind them honks its horn or startles them. You see the lady turn around, too. And if you look on the right in slow motion, the cat does two things. It does a front flip. And it's by when, but when it goes front flip, it's now upside down and facing in the opposite direction it was. Now it does a cat twist in the middle, so now it's facing right side up again. So the cat gets away with combining not just its reflexive twist, but an extra flip in order to turn around really quickly. And here's another one. This blew my mind. This is a cat doing the cat twist twice. There's the second time. So when it jumps up in the air to try and grab the toy, it ends up falling backwards, basically. So it's upside down. It does a cat twist. It's still got angular momentum. It's still flipping back over upside down. So it does a second twist to right itself. So first twist, you see its butt keeps going over its head. So it's like, OK, I better do another twist to get back down. <laughs> so cats can do more than one. They're, they're cleverer. They're, they're ahead of us in terms of cat twisting technology. <laughs> now, qu another question that I. I was curious about when I was writing my book is, do really big cats have the same reflex? And if you look at mid-size wild casts, things like, uh, like, uh, like uh, what are they? Well, some of the mid-size cats whose names are escaping me at the moment, you find they can do the same thing. And then you ask, can lions do this? Can tigers do this? They're really big animals. And they do spend time in trees. So 
I found no formal research studying cat reflexes in lions, but I did find some videos on the internet that suggests they do not seem to have it. It seems like when they start to fall, they hang on for dear life, and if they can, they crawl themselves down to a lower altitude before they just let go to fall. And, and that kind of makes sense that bigger cats, you don't normally expect to see them as often in trees, so they probably didn't develop this reflex like the smaller cats did. And here's another video which might need to be started. Um, other animals can do the same sort of twist. Um, this is an offensive use of the cat type twist. Mongooses hunt cobras. Watch the cobra try and strike. The mongoose leaps in a really weird way. Watch the propeller tail. There's that tail going crazy. But you also, right there, you can see it twist its body to land on its feet and still be facing the cobra. And so they can take advantage. They need to be able to move and jump very quickly to get, get out of danger. The end of this video, the cobra gives the mongoose a good bite, but don't worry about it. Mongooses are immune to cobra poison, so it basically leaves without its dignity, but otherwise is fine. <laughs> and let's see if I can get past. Ah, oh, yeah. One more interesting question to answer. Um, I call it a hairy puzzle because turns out that rabbits have a writing reflex. And, you know, cats, we understand why they can land on their feet. They, lay, they hang out in trees. I don't see a lot of rabbits in trees. Um, in the 1960s, a British physiologist, Giles Brindley, who's a fascinating guy, he decided to study this writing reflex in rabbits, and he came up with increasingly bizarre techniques, one of which was he put a rabbit on a slope. So on the slope, the rabbit feels like gravity is at an angle to the floor of the box. And then he opens up the box at the bottom and then sees which way does the rabbit twist to land. And it turns out that the rabbit twists to match the apparent angle of gravity and not the actual angle of gravity. And then he does the same thing. He took, or he took a rabbit in a box in a car, took it around a tight turn and dropped it, and even, wanted to, and even put it in a centrifuge. <laughs> I'm assuming not very fast. Um, but what he found, and this answers a question I asked earlier about the physiologist, how does even a blindfolded animal know which way to fall? It turns out they have a, 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 a memory of several seconds about which way gravity is pointing. Um, and we're not, it's not really understood how that works, but a number of experiments have confirmed that. It seems that if you switch off gravity, cat, cats and rabbits will know which way is down for a few seconds and then kind of lose it. But you may ask again, why do rabbits have that reflex at all? Um, this is another video that I found just last year and it blew my mind. Look at the right. We have this was somebody using a golden eagle to try and hunt a jackrabbit. Watch the jackrabbit's response. The eagle swoops, the jackrabbit goes straight up. And the eagle manages to hit it, so the rabbit starts spinning. But the rabbit, because of the writing reflex, lands on its feet and takes off. The rabbit uses this as a defensive mechanism by going in the one direction the eagle cannot easily go, which is straight up. And Rabbits also use this for courtship and fighting and presumably play as well. And this was just another example of one of those things that I discovered after I finished my book that just absolutely delighted me. And that's where I pretty much wrap up. Um, I like to say the overall theme is even seemingly mundane phenomenon like a falling cat can have really beautiful and profound physics behind it. And, and the usual caution, please don't drop your own cats. As you can see, not every cat knows what it's doing, <laughs> reflex or not. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. sister-in-law sometimes puts a hair scrunchie on her cat and the cat falls over. Does this have some <laughs> sort of uh, implication there for, you know?
their sense of when and how to turn? You know, I'm, yeah, I'm not. I have not heard that. But now that you mention it, yeah, cats do not like having stuff put on them, and um, and yeah, and they will often react by just flopping over. So I can't say for certain, and I've never encountered it. But could it, ver it could very well be that somehow that messes a little bit with their sense of position and equilibrium. So entirely plausible. Yeah. yeah. Is there any connection between how cats turn themselves and how like gymnasts would control their motion through the air? Yes, how, how the relation between how cats turn and how gymnasts turn. Yes, and in fact, it's quite funny. This is a good example. I think cat turning is a good example of science discovering something that people other people knew about already. Like, so when, when these videos of, um, you know, falling cats were shown in 1894, there were already high divers. There were already people jumping off of diving boards and twisting and turning. There was also a thing called bicycle diving where people would drive bicycles off of cliffs for, into a river. Um, that's a whole other story. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, it's the same sort of phenomenon of using sort of internal body motions to change your overall orientation. And it's kind of fascinating to see that it was there all along. And so you, you can understand how it happened, but the physicists in 1894 shouldn't have been so surprised. But another anecdote to that is in the 1960s, there was another researcher who wanted to really test the phenomenon again. Um, and he, he hired professional divers to do this. And he used high-speed camera, but he wanted to make sure they did not have any initial rotation when they left the diving board. And they were often just hanging from the bottom of the diving board. They'd claw, crawl under it with their arms and legs. And basically, they'd say, go. And they'd let go. But to make sure they didn't unconsciously give themselves some initial rotation, he said, I only want you to turn if I blow a whistle. So he would, he would you know, randomly decide on each dive whether to blow the whistle or not. If he blew the whistle, presumably they went in well. I'm guessing if he didn't blow the whistle, they just went splat on the water. Um, but there are nice photographs of that, too, of, of divers being able to twist and follow the same sort of pattern. Thank you. Yes? At some point, I had heard of a theory that it was kind of related to Murphy's law, that the periodicity would actually tell if the cat would be able to land on their feet or not. How does that relate to the theories that you saw? The, could you mention the first part again? Uh, I've read some theories that it was related to Murphy's law. Oh. The periodicity of the oh, height okay. was determining if the cat would be able to land on their feet or not. Oh, OK. So just basically whether it, whether it was just sort of that the, the height, that they were sort of naturally turning and they managed to land on their feet depending on how high they were. Yeah, it doesn't, it seems like it's, it, it doesn't seem like it's quite that connected to that quite much because cats seem to be able to fall really well from almost any height. And they seem to have a really good sense for it. So it's really an active technique, which is why so many people have been studying this endlessly over the years. And also, it's just fun to you know, watch cat videos for a job. <laughs> I was, yeah? Yep, go ahead. Um, if cats are so good at falling, like, why are we calling the fire department to get them off? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, why, yeah, why do we have to call the fire department to rescue cats from trees and stuff? The, fu the best I can say is it seems like cats are very good at getting up in trees, but they're not very good at getting down in a controlled, slow manner. <laughs> so um, yeah, in principle, a lot of them could just jump and land safely. And probably some of them do, but there seem to be a lot of cats that just don't know what to do. They get up there and they sit up there. I once helped a friend whose cat, one of their cats got out and climbed up like 80 feet into a tree and would not come down. They hired a cherry picker to come out to try and get the cat. And once they sent the guy up at the cherry picker, the cat decided to jump. Um, we put a bunch of air mattresses out to try and catch its fall. It missed all of the air mattresses. <laughs> Um, but it ended up being okay. We had minor injuries. But yeah, in, in cats in general, this reminds me of a statement I make about cats, is that cats are 
smarter than we think, but less smart than they think. <laughs> they tend to like to get themselves into situations they're not really sure how to get out of. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, did Kane and Cher have to submit a proposal to NASA to get funding? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did they get money from NASA to, uh, to do cat falling experiments? That's a fair question. I'm not sure. I can only think that being like the 1960s and the space race being at its peak, that probably they were just throwing money at anything space related that would help. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually seen the proposal. Like, I've seen a bunch of internal documents um, on various things, but I've never seen the Kane and Share proposal. And, you know, I really need to go look that up. I had not occurred to me to look at that. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's thank Greg again.